Chapter One of Best Russian Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of Best Russian Short Stories. Edited and compiled by Thomas Seltzer. The Queen of Spades by Alexander Pushkin. One. There was a card party at the rooms of Naramov of the Horse Guards. The long winter night passed away imperceptibly, and it was five o'clock in the morning before the company sat down to supper. Those who had won ate with a good appetite. The others sat staring absently at their empty plates. When the champagne appeared, however, the conversation became more animated and all took part in it. And how did you fare, sir? And asked the host. Oh, I lost as usual. I must confess that I am unlucky. I play Merindol. I always keep cool. I never allow anything to put me out and yet I always lose. And you did not once allow yourself to be tempted to back the red. Your firmness astonishes me. But what do you think of Herman? said one of the guests, pointing to a young engineer. He has never had a card in his hand in his life. He has never in his life laid a wager, and yet he sits here till five o'clock in the morning watching our play. Play interests me very much, said Herman, but I am not in the position to sacrifice the necessary in the hope of winning the superfluous. Herman is a German. He's economical, that is all, observed Tomsky but if there's one person that i can't understand it is my grandmother the countess anna berotovna how so inquired the guests i cannot understand continued tomsky how it is that my grandmother does not punt what is there remarkable about an old lady of eighty not punting said naramov then you do not know the reason why no really haven't the faintest idea about sixty years ago my grandmother went to paris where she created quite a sensation people used to run after her to catch a glimpse of the muscovite venus richelieu made love to her and my grandmother maintains that he almost blew out his brains in consequence of her cruelty at that time ladies used to play faro on one occasion at the court she lost a very considerable sum to the duke of orleans on returning home my grandmother removed the patches from her face took off her hoops informed my grandfather of her loss at the gaming table and ordered him to pay the money my deceased grandfather as far as i remember was a sort of house steward to my grandmother he dreaded her like fire but on hearing of such a heavy loss he almost went out of his mind he calculated the various sums she had lost and pointed out to her that in six months she had spent half a million francs that neither their moscow nor saratov estates were in paris and finally refused point-blank to pay the debt my grandmother gave him a box on the ear and slept by herself as a sign of her displeasure the next day she sent for her husband hoping that this domestic punishment had produced an effect upon him but she found him inflexible for the first time in her life she entered into reasonings and explanations with him thinking to be able to convince him by pointing out to him that there are debts and debts and that there's a great difference between a prince and a coachmaker but it was all in vain my grandfather still remained obdurate but the matter did not rest there my grandmother didn't know what to do she had shortly before become acquainted with a very remarkable man you have heard of count st germain about whom so many marvellous stories are told you know that he represented himself as the wandering jew as the discoverer of the elixir of life of the philosopher's stone and so forth some laughed at him as a charlatan but casanova in his memoirs says that he was a spy but be that as it may st germain in spite of the mystery surrounding him was a very fascinating person and was much sought after in the best circles of society even to this day my grandmother retains an affectionate recollection of him and becomes quite angry if anyone speaks disrespectfully of him my grandfather knew that st germain had large sums of money at his disposal she resolved to have recourse to him and she wrote a letter to him asking him to come to her without delay the queer old man immediately waited upon her and found her overwhelmed with grief she described to him in the blackest colours the barbarity of her husband and ended by declaring that her whole hope depended upon his friendship and amiability st germain reflected i could advance you the sum you want said he but i know that you would not rest easy until you had paid me back and i should not like to bring fresh troubles upon you but there's another way of getting out of your difficulty you can win back your money but my dear count replied my grandmother i tell you that i haven't any money left money is not necessary replied st germain be pleased to listen to me then he revealed to her a secret for which each of us would give a good deal the young officers listened with increased attention tomsky lit his pipe puffed away for a moment and then continued that same evening my grandmother went to versailles to the jeu de la reine the duke of orleans kept the bank my grandmother excused herself in an off-hand manner for not having yet paid her debt by inventing some little story and then began to play against him she chose three cards and played them one after the other all three won sonica set of a card when it wins or loses in the quickest possible time and my grandmother recovered every farthing that she had lost mere chance said one of the guests a tale observed herman 
perhaps they were marked cards said a third i don't think so replied tomsky gravely what said narumov you have a grandmother who knows how to hit upon three lucky cards in succession and you have never yet succeeded in getting the secret of it out of her that's the deuce of it all replied tomsky she had four sons one of whom was my father all four were determined gamblers and yet not to one of them did she ever reveal her secret although it would not have been a bad thing either for them or for me but this is what i've heard from my uncle count ivan ilyich and he assured me on his honour that it was true the late chaplitsky the same who died in poverty after having squandered millions once lost in his youth about three hundred thousand roubles to zorich if i remember rightly he was in despair my grandmother who was always very severe upon the extravagance of young men took pity however upon chaplitsky she gave him three cards telling him to play them one after another at the same time exacting from him a solemn promise that he would never play at cards again as long as he lived chaplitsky then went to his victorious opponent and then began a fresh game on the first card he staked fifty thousand roubles in one sonica he doubled the stake and won again till at last by pursuing the same tactics he won back more than he had lost but it's time to go to bed it's a quarter of six already and indeed it was already beginning to dawn the young men emptied their glasses and then took leave of each other too the old countess a was seated in her dressing-room in front of her looking-glass three waiting-maids stood around her one held a small pot of rouge another a box of hairpins and the third a tall can with bright red ribbons the countess had no longer the slightest pretensions to beauty but she still preserved the habits of her youth dressed in strict accordance with the fashion of seventy years before and made as long and as careful a toilette as she would have done sixty years previously near the window at her embroidery frame sat a young lady a ward good morning grandmamma said a young officer entering the room bonjour mademoiselle lise grandmamma i want to ask you something what is it paul i want you to let me introduce one of my friends to you and to allow me to bring him to the ball on friday bring him directly to the ball and introduce him to me there were you at b s yesterday yes everything went off very pleasantly and dancing was kept up until five o'clock how charming yeletskaya was but my dear what is there charming about her isn't she like a grandmother the princess daria petrovna by the way she must be very old the princess daria petrovna how do you mean old cried tomsky thoughtlessly she died seven years ago the young lady raised her head and made a sign to the young officer he then remembered that the old countess was never to be informed of the death of any of her contemporaries and he bit his lips the old countess heard the news with the greatest indifference dead said she and i didn't know it we were appointed maids of honour at the same time and we were presented to the empress and the countess for the hundredth time related to her grandson one of her anecdotes come paul said she when she had finished her story help me to get up lazanka where is my snuff-box and the countess with her three maids went behind a screen to finish her toilette tomsky was left alone with the young lady who is the gentleman you wish to introduce to the countess asked lizaveta ivanovna in a whisper narumov do you know him no is he a soldier or a civilian a soldier is he in the engineers no in the cavalry what made you think he was in the engineers the young lady smiled but made no reply paul cried the countess from behind the screen send me some new novel only pray don't let it be one of the present-day style what do you mean grandmother that is a novel in which the hero strangles neither his father nor his mother and in which there are no drowned bodies i have a great horror of drowned persons there are no such novels nowadays would you like a russian one are there any russian novels send me one dear pray send me one good-bye grandmother i'm in a hurry good-bye lizaveta ivanovna what made you think that narumov was in the engineers and tomsky left the boudoir lizaveta ivanovna was left alone she laid aside her work and began to look out the window a few moments afterwards at a corner house on the other side of the street a young officer appeared a deep blush covered her cheeks she took up her work again and bent her head down over the frame at the same moment the countess returned completely dressed go to the carriage lizaveta said she we will go out for a drive lizaveta arose from the frame and began to arrange her work what is the matter with you my child are you deaf cried the countess order the carriage to get ready at once i will do so this moment replied the young lady hastening into the ante-room a servant entered and gave the countess some books from prince paul alexandrovitch tell him that i am much obliged to him said the countess lizaveta lizaveta where are you running to i am going to dress there is plenty of time my dear sit down here open the first volume and read to me aloud her companion took the book and read a few lines louder said the countess what is the matter with you my child have you lost your voice wait give me that footstool a little nearer that will do lizaveta read two more pages the countess yawned put the book down said she what a lot of nonsense send it back to prince paul with my thanks but where is the carriage the carriage is ready said lizaveta looking out into the street how is it that you are not dressed said the countess i must always wait for you it is intolerable my dear 
Liza hastened to her room. She had not been there two minutes before the countess began to ring with all her might. The three waiting maids came running in at one door and the valet at another. How is it that you cannot hear me when I ring for you? said the countess. Tell Lizaveta Ivanovna that I am waiting for her. Lizaveta returned with her hat and cloak on. At last you're here, said the countess. But why such an elaborate toilette? Whom do you intend to captivate? What sort of weather is it? It seems rather windy. No, your ladyship, it's very calm, replied the valet. You never think of what you're talking about. Open the window. So it is. Windy and bitterly cold. Unharness the horse. Lizaveta, we won't go out. There was no need for you to deck yourself like that. What a life is mine, thought Lizaveta Ivanovna. And in truth, Lizaveta Ivanovna was a very unfortunate creature. The bread of the stranger is bitter, said Dante, and a staircase hard to climb. But who can know what the bitterness of dependence is so well as the poor companion of an old lady of quality? The Countess A. had by no means a bad heart, but she was capricious like a woman who had been spoilt by the world, as well as being avaricious and egotistical like all old people who have seen their best days, and whose thoughts are with the past and not on the present. She participated in all the vanities of the great world, went to balls where she sat in a corner, painted and dressed in old-fashioned style, like a deformed but indispensable ornament of the ballroom. All the guests on entering approached her and made a profound bow, as if in accordance with a set ceremony, but after that nobody took any further notice of her. She received the whole town at her house, and observed the strictest etiquette, although she could no longer recognize the faces of people. Her numerous domestics, growing fat and old in her antechamber and in servants' hall, did just as they liked, and vied with each other in robbing the aged countess in the most barefaced manner. Lizaveta Ivanovna was the martyr of the household. She made tea and was reproached with using too much sugar. She read novels aloud to the countess, and the faults of the author were visited upon her head. She accompanied the countess in her walks, and was answerable for the weather or the state of the pavement. A salary was attached to her post, but she very rarely received it. Although she was expected to dress like everyone else, that is to say, like very few indeed, in the society she played the most pitiable role. Everybody knew her, and nobody paid attention to her. At balls she danced only when a partner was wanted, and ladies would only take hold of her arm when it was necessary to lead her out of the room to attend to their dresses. She was very self-conscious and felt her position keenly, and she looked about her with impatience for a deliverer to come to her rescue. But the young men, calculating in their giddiness, honored her with but very little attention, although Lizaveta Ivanovna was a hundred times prettier than the bare-faced and cold-hearted marriageable girls around whom they hovered. Many a time did she quietly slink away from the glittering but wearisome drawing-room to go and cry in her own poor little room, in which stood a screen, a chest of drawers, a looking-glass, and a painted bedstead, and where a tallow candle burnt feebly in a copper candlestick. One morning, this was about two days after the evening party, described at the beginning of this story, and a week previous to the scene at which we have just assisted, Lizaveta Ivanovna was seated near the window at her embroidery frame. When happening to look out into the street, she caught sight of a young engineer officer, standing motionless with his eyes fixed upon her window. She lowered her head and went on again with her work. About five minutes afterwards, she looked out again. The young officer was still standing in the same place. Not being in the habit of coquetting with passing officers, she did not continue to gaze out into the street, but went on sewing for a couple of hours without raising her head. Dinner was announced. She rose up and began to put her embroidery away, but glancing casually out the window, she perceived the officer again. After dinner, she went to the window with a certain feeling of uneasiness, but the officer was no longer there, and she thought no more about him. A couple of days afterwards, just as she was stepping into the carriage with the countess, she saw him again. He was standing close behind the door, with his face half concealed by his fur collar, but his dark eyes sparkled beneath his cap. Lizaveta felt alarmed, though she knew not why, and she trembled as she seated herself in the carriage. On returning home, she hastened to the window. The officer was standing in his accustomed place with his eyes fixed upon her. She drew back, a prey to curiosity, and agitated by a feeling which was quite new to her. From that time forward, not a day passed without the young officer making his appearance under the window at the customary hour and between him and her there was established a sort of mute acquaintance sitting in her place at work she used to feel his approach and raising her head she would look at him longer and longer each day the young man seemed to be very grateful to her she saw with the sharp eye of youth how a sudden flush covered his pale cheeks each time their glances met after about a week she commenced to smile at him when tomsky asked permission of his grandmother the countess to present one of his friends to her the young girl's heart beat violently but hearing that Naramov was not an engineer, she regretted that by her thoughtless question she had betrayed her secret to the volatile Tomsky. Herman was the son of a German who had become a naturalized Russian, and from whom he had inherited a small capital. Being firmly convinced of the necessity of preserving his independence, Herman did not touch his private income, but lived on his pay without allowing himself the slightest luxury. 
moreover he was reserved and ambitious and his companions really had an opportunity of making merry at the expense of his extreme parsimony he had strong passions and an ardent imagination but his firmness of disposition preserved him from the ordinary errors of young men thus though a gamester at heart he never touched a card for he considered his position did not allow him as he said to risk the necessary in hope of winning the superfluous yet he would sit for nights together at the card-table and follow with feverish anxiety the different turns of the game the story of the three cards had produced a powerful impression upon his imagination and all night long he could think of nothing else if he thought to himself the following evening as he walked along the streets of st petersburg if the old countess would but reveal her secret to me if she would only tell me the names of the three winning cards why should i not try my fortune i must get introduced to her and win her favor become her lover but all that will take time and she's eighty-seven years old she might be dead in a week in a couple of days even but the story itself can it really be true no economy temperance and industry those are my three winning cards by means of them i shall be able to double my capital increase it sevenfold and procure myself ease and independence musing in this manner he walked on until he found himself in one of the principal streets of st petersburg in front of a house of antiquated architecture the street was blocked with equipages carriages one after the other drew up in front of the brilliantly illuminated doorway at one moment there stepped out on to the pavement the well-shaped little foot of some young beauty at another the heavy boot of a cavalry officer and then the silk stockings and shoes of a member of the diplomatic world furs and cloaks passed in rapid succession before the gigantic porter at the entrance herman stopped whose house is this he asked the watchman at the corner the countess a's replied the watchman herman started the strange story of the three cards again presented itself to his imagination he began walking up and down before the house thinking of its owner and her strange secret returning late to his modest lodging he could not go to sleep for a long time and when at last he did doze off he could dream of nothing but cards green tables piles of banknotes and heaps of ducats he played one card after another winning in uninterruptedly and then he gathered up the gold and filled his pockets with the notes when he woke up late the next morning he sighed over the loss of his imaginary wealth and then sallying out into the town he found himself once more in front of the countess's residence some unknown power seemed to have attracted him thither he stopped and looked up at the windows at one of these he saw a head with luxuriant black hair which was bent down probably over some book or an embroidery frame the head was raised herman saw a fresh complexion and a pair of dark eyes that moment decided his fate three lizaveta ivanovna had scarcely taken off her hat and cloak when the countess sent for her and again ordered her to get the carriage ready the vehicle drew up before the door and they prepared to take their seats just at that moment when two footmen were assisting the old lady to enter the carriage lizaveta saw her engineer standing close beside the wheel he grasped her hand alarm caused her to lose her presence of mind and the young man disappeared but not before he had left a letter between her fingers she concealed it in her glove and during the whole of the drive she neither saw nor heard anything it was the custom of the countess when out for an airing in her carriage to be constantly asking such questions as who was that person that met us just now what is the name of this bridge what is written on that signboard on this occasion however lizaveta returned such vague and absurd answers that the countess became angry with her what is the matter with you my dear she exclaimed have you taken leave of your senses or what is it do you not hear me or understand what i say heaven be thanked i am still in my right mind and speak plainly enough lizaveta ivanovna did not hear her. on returning home she ran to her room and drew the letter out of her glove it was not sealed lizaveta read it the letter contained a declaration of love it was tender respectful and copied word for word from a german novel but lizaveta did not know anything of the german language and she was quite delighted for all that the letter caused her to feel exceedingly uneasy for the first time in her life she was entering into secret and confidential relations with a young man his boldness alarmed her she reproached herself for her imprudent behavior and knew not what to do should she cease to sit at the window and by assuming an appearance of indifference towards him put a check upon the young officer's desire for further acquaintance with her should she send his letter back to him or should she answer him in a cold and decided manner there was nobody to whom she could turn in. in her perplexity for she had neither female friend nor adviser at length she resolved to reply to him she sat down at her little writing-table took pen and paper and began to think several times she began her letter and then tore it up the way she had expressed herself seemed to be either too inviting or too cold and decisive at last she succeeded in writing a few lines with which she felt satisfied i am convinced she wrote that your intentions are honourable and that you do not wish to offend me by any imprudent behavior but our acquaintance must not begin in such a manner 
i return you your letter and i hope that i shall never have any cause to complain of this undeserved slight the next day as soon as herman made his appearance lizaveta rose from her embroidery went into the drawing-room opened the ventilator and threw the letter into the street trusting that the young officer would have the perception to pick it up herman hasted forward picked it up and then repaired to a confectioner's shop breaking the seal of the envelope he found inside it his own letter and lizaveta's reply he had expected this and he returned home his mind deeply occupied with its intrigue three days afterwards a bright-eyed young girl from a milliner's establishment brought lizaveta a letter lizaveta opened it with great uneasiness fearing that it was a demand for money when suddenly she recognized herman's handwriting you've made a mistake my dear said she this letter's not for me oh yes it's for you replied the girl smiling very knowingly have the goodness to read it lizaveta glanced at the letter herman requested an interview it cannot be she cried alarmed at the audacious request and the manner in which it was made this letter is certainly not for me and she tore it into fragments if the letter was not for you why have you torn it up said the girl i should have given it back to the person who sent it be good enough my dear said lizaveta disconcerted by this remark not to bring me any more letters for the future and tell the person who sent you that he ought to be ashamed but herman was not the man to be thus put off every day lizaveta received from him a letter sent now in this way now in that they were no longer translated from the german herman wrote them under the inspiration of passion and spoke in his own language and they bore full testimony to the inflexibility of his desire and the disordered condition of his uncontrollable imagination lizaveta no longer thought of sending them back to him she became intoxicated with them and began to reply to them and little by little her answers became longer and more affectionate at last she threw out of the window to him the following letter this evening there is going to be a ball at the embassy the countess will be there we shall remain until two o'clock you have now an opportunity of seeing me alone as soon as the countess is gone the servants will very probably go out and there will be nobody left but the swiss but he usually goes to sleep in his lodge come about half-past eleven walk straight upstairs if you meet anybody in the ante-room ask if the countess is at home you will be told no in which case there will be nothing left for you to do but to go away again but it is most probable that you will meet nobody the maid-servants will all be together in one room on leaving the ante-room turn to the left and walk straight on until you reach the countess's bedroom in the bedroom behind a screen you will find two doors the one on the right leads to a cabinet which the countess never enters the one on the left leads to a corridor at the end of which is a little winding staircase this leads to my room herman trembled like a tiger as he waited for the appointed time to arrive at ten o'clock in the evening he was already in front of the countess's house the weather was terrible the wind blew with great violence the sleety snow fell in large flakes the lamps emitted a feeble light the street was deserted from time to time a sledge drawn by a sorry-looking hack passed by on the lookout for a belated passenger herman was enveloped in a thick overcoat and felt neither wind nor snow at last the countess's carriage drew up herman saw two footmen carry out in their arms the bent form of the old lady wrapped in sable fur and immediately behind her clad in a warm mantle and with her head ornamented with a wreath of fresh flowers followed lizaveta the door was closed the carriage rolled away heavily through the yielding snow the porter shut the screen door the windows became dark herman began walking up and down near the deserted house at length he stopped under a lamp and glanced at his watch it was twenty minutes past eleven he remained standing under the lamp his eyes fixed upon the watch impatiently waiting for the remaining minutes to pass at half past eleven precisely herman ascended the steps of the house and made his way into the brightly illuminated vestibule the porter was not there herman hastily ascended the staircase opened the door of the ante-room and saw a footman sitting asleep in an antique chair by the side of a lamp with a light firm step herman passed by him the drawing-room and dining-room were in darkness but a feeble reflection penetrated thither from the lamp in the ante-room herman reached the countess's bedroom before a shrine which was full of old images a golden lamp was burning faded stuffed chairs and divans with soft cushions stood in melancholy symmetry around the room the walls of which were hung with china silk on one side of the room hung two portraits painted in paris by madame lebrun one of these represented a stout red-faced man of about forty years of age in a bright green uniform and with a star upon his breast the other a beautiful young woman with an aquiline nose forehead curls and a rose in her powdered hair in the corners stood porcelain shepherds and shepherdesses dining-room clocks from the workshop of the celebrated lefroy bandboxes roulettes fans and the various playthings for the amusement of ladies that were in vogue at the end of the last century when montgolfier's balloons and mesmer's magnetism were the rage herman stepped behind the screen at the back of it stood a little iron bedstead on the right was the door which led to the cabinet on the left the other which led to the corridor 
he opened the latter and saw the little winding staircase which led to the room of the poor companion but he retraced his steps and entered the dark cabinet time passed slowly all was still the clock in the drawing-room struck twelve the strokes echoed through the room one after the other and everything was quiet again herman stood leaning against the cold stove he was calm his heart beat regularly like that of a man resolved upon a dangerous but inevitable undertaking one o'clock in the morning struck then two and he heard the distant noise of carriage wheels an involuntary agitation took possession of him the carriage drew near and stopped he heard the sound of the carriage steps being let down all was bustle within the house the servants were running hither and thither there was a confusion of voices and the rooms were lit up three antiquated chambermaids entered the room and they were shortly afterwards followed by the countess who more dead than alive sank into a voltaire armchair herman peeped through a chink lizaveta ivanova passed close by him and he heard her hurried steps as she hastened up the little spiral staircase for a moment his heart was assailed by something like a pricking of conscience but the emotion was only transitory and his heart became petrified as before the countess began to undress before her looking-glass her rose-bedecked cap was taken off and then her powdered wig was removed from her white and closely cut hair hairpins fell in showers around her her yellow satin dress brocaded with silver fell down at her swollen feet herman was a witness of the repugnant mysteries of her toilette at last the countess was in her nightcap and dressing-gown and in this costume more suitable to her age she appeared less hideous and deformed like all old people in general the countess suffered from sleeplessness having undressed she seated herself at the window in a voltaire armchair and dismissed her maids the candles were taken away and once more the room was left with only one lamp burning in it the countess sat there looking quite yellow mumbling with her flaccid lips and swaying to and fro her dull eyes expressed complete vacancy of mind and looking at her one would have thought that the rocking of her body was not a voluntary action of her own but was produced by the action of some concealed galvanic mechanism suddenly the death-like face assumed an inexplicable expression the lips ceased to tremble the eyes became animated before the countess stood an unknown man do not be alarmed for heaven's sake do not be alarmed said he in a low but distinct voice i have no intention of doing you any harm i have only come to ask a favor of you the old woman looked at him in silence as if she had not heard what he had said herman thought that she was deaf and bending down towards her ear he repeated what he had said the aged countess remained silent as before you can ensure the happiness of my life continued herman and it will cost you nothing i know that you can name three cards in order herman stopped the countess appeared now to understand what he wanted she seemed as if seeking for words to reply it was a joke she replied at last i assure you it was only a joke there's no joking about the matter replied herman angrily remember chaplitsky whom you helped to win the countess became visibly uneasy her features expressed strong emotion but they quickly resumed their firmer immobility can you not name me these three winning cards continued herman the countess remained silent herman continued for whom are you preserving your secret for your grandsons they're rich enough without it they do not know the worth of money your cards would be of no use to a spendthrift he who cannot preserve his paternal inheritance will die in want even though he had a demon at his service i am not a man of that sort i know the value of money your three cards will not be thrown away upon me come he paused and trembling awaited her reply the countess remained silent herman fell upon his knees if your heart has ever known the feeling of love said he if you remember its rapture if you have ever smiled at the cry of your newborn child if any human feeling has ever entered into your breast i entreat you by the feelings of a wife a lover a mother by all that is most sacred in life not to reject my prayer reveal to me your secret of what use is it to you maybe it is connected with some terrible sin with the loss of eternal salvation with some bargain with the devil reflect you are old you have not long to live i am ready to take your sins upon my soul only reveal to me your secret remember that the happiness of a man is in your hands that not only i but my children and grandchildren will bless your memory and reverence you as a saint the old countess answered not a word herman rose to his feet you old hag he explained grinding his teeth then i will make you answer and with these words he drew a pistol from his pocket at the sight of the pistol the countess for the second time exhibited strong emotion she shook her head and raised her hands as if to protect herself from the shot then she fell backwards and remained motionless come an end to this childish nonsense said herman taking hold of her hand i ask you for the last time will you tell me the names of your three cards or will you not the countess made no reply herman perceived that she was dead end of the queen of spades by alexander pushkin part one